Paint me red in the sight that isn't mine. Finding every reason you can find to push my love. Remember that it's not me. I was never the one who broke your heart. We both know I've been gentle from the start. So though the questions keep on coming this time, you know that I'll listen. You know I'll be patient. Connected thoughts that weren't there You gave attention to the thoughts I never wear It's not my style but Even though it's so clear to me You shouldn't base the future on the past I know you really want this thing to last So though the questions keep on coming this time You know that I'll listen You know I'll be patient With you, you're my baby Maybe this time Trust me, you'll know I'll be faithful to you, young baby. <laughs>
Alright, good afternoon, Friday afternoon. Let's make sure the stream title is up. It doesn't seem. Okay, there we go. Cool, good afternoon. Welcome to the first Science Fridays ever. I'm really excited to start uh, this segment every week. Um, so, I guess I should begin by introducing what Science Fridays is going to be uh, from here on out and um, kind of the, the lay of the land. So basically, I guess a little bit of background of me. Um, I am a graduate student. I'm a fourth year graduate student in a social neuroscience program. So I'm basically fusing social psychology with neuroscience to kind of uh, address social psychological theories and questions with some methodologies found in neuroscience. Um, and we also like in our lab, we also pull in cognitive psychology and things like that and um so my degree right now is in social neuroscience and that's where i'm kind of um i'm focusing in on a lot of uh areas in social psychology where you would call intergroup conflict or intergroup processes um so it deals a lot with people's social identities and such and things like that but i'm also very comfortable talking about biology and the brain as a physical organ um, so, as a graduate student, every Friday, since like our very first year, every Friday we have to attend something called uh, social psychology area meeting or um, in broad term for grad school it's called a seminar. And basically it's where you show up and there's a guest speaker and this guest speaker is invited from different universities, it could be from the same country or it could be from all over the world, we get speakers from everywhere. And basically they present research that it, they're currently doing at their university and their lab and we just listen and learn because this is probably research that's not taking on, that's not taking place in our current establishment. So it's kind of nice to be hearing what other people are doing and how their theories can integrate to our theories or their science can inform our science and vice versa. So it allows for an exchange of ideas between scientists. Um, so every Friday, this is what we do. We kind of uh, show up the department. So faculty and, and grad students all show up and listen to a talker, uh, listen to a researcher, sorry, listen to a researcher, give a talk and um, and yeah, and we just sit there and listen, take notes. And if it doesn't really relate to our subject, you might not be as engaged, but um, it's still nonetheless very interesting to be hearing uh, about science across all different types of fields. Um, so my notion behind what I started to feel was like, this is really cool um, information that's being shared with me. I feel like really lucky to be there, to be like among all these uh, researchers and scientists who like are very passionate about the pursuit of knowledge and data and like understanding the world around us and just telling everyone else about it and I just feel very fortunate to be there and um, I always had this feeling of like I just want to talk about what we just listened I just really want to just talk about this science with people and just get what they think about it and like how they conceptualize some of these factors how they conceptualize some of this science and what what they feel about it or what they think about it and how it might apply to our daily lives um, however it's as a graduate student, your peers are other grads and we all tend to be very busy. So it becomes rather tough to be able to discuss the science right afterwards. I mean, sometimes the uh, guest speaker, this is before COVID times, would kind of um, hang back for like another hour and have lunch with grads. So we could just talk with a um, more relaxed setting. And hold on, I'm getting a stream error. Okay, I think we're still good. Okay, cool. Um, so, this was during. This is before COVID came. So now with COVID, our our seminars are still taking place, but they're done online. So we don't really get that hour afterwards. So it, like lately, I've been feeling like, man, I can't discuss like these ideas with people, and I and I really love to discuss some of these ideas. Um, the other thing I kind of thought was like these people are traveling and working hard to make these presentations. It's not like a presentation is extremely easy for a professor to give. They 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 put pressure on themselves or a researcher. It's not always just professors, but just researchers in general. They they put pressure on themselves to give a very good presentation because they're about to go in front of like 80 other scientists and they're like gonna they're pressured to to be like I need to not waste their time and they're all gonna be like be scrutinizing my science and I want to make sure like I sound as accurate and as um, 
as easy to understand and stuff. So they really put effort and time into their presentations. And a lot of them have been doing it for a while. So of course it comes like a little bit more natural to them, but nonetheless, it's still energy spent by these researchers. So um, I feel like they're putting on all this work and they're sharing this, these ideas with, with a crowd, which is awesome. But what if we could extend those researchers uh, grasp a little bit further? What if we could, you know, just start telling people that may not have access to these seminars such as I do, what if we could start reaching them and people who are interested in listening to the science that's going on in universities? Um, although these professors and researchers do try their best to broadcast, I, I know a lot of my own advi my own advisor and other uh, professors usually go like they'll talk on radio shows or they'll give interviews and they'll talk about their science and stuff. But let's open up another channel, especially one that can be like this is always going to be intended to be a, a fun environment and not a like teaching and like lecture style environment. Um, so that's what this is intended to be. So I'm trying to extend like these researchers uh, grasp or whatever grab or hold. I, I want to just broadcast their voice a little bit on, on, online, but um, it's not intended to be. So just a little contrast, this is not going to be a presentation of their research and I'm not going to go into their nitty gritty methodologies or data because I just heard it the same day. It's not like I'm already a master of what they're doing. So I can't put words in their mouth and I can't really teach what they're doing, but I can relay the information that they're getting at. So for example, today's researcher was uh, Dr. Jack Glazer from UC Berkeley. And he's involved, I was really like inspired by him. He was, he's a scientist that's involved in a lot of different, um, pol like he has influence in policymakers to inform them what the science is saying regarding um, implicit bias, especially implicit bias uh, that may be present within police and the way police are enforcing the law. And so um, it's very nice to hear from scientists who are applying their science and, and making change in our society. Um, so that was today's lecture. And so that kind of that kind of opens up this discussion of what is implicit bias? What do people think is implicit bias? What is it and what is it not? Um, how do we conceptualize implicit bias? We all we're all humans. And so social psychology is very nice to talk about because we as humans can all kind of relate to these theories. We can all kind of give our own personal experience and it doesn't instantly make it invalid because you are a human experiencing it. So it makes it in a sense a valid data point. Um, so that's why social psychology can be a lot of fun to talk about. So I wanted to create this space here to have fun, relax, listen to music and chat about science. And I can and I can be feeding topics every single week just based on what I heard from a, from the scientist's mouth. Again, I'm not going to be reporting like their figures, their data, uh, their studies and stuff like that. I think that is better spread through me just giving you straight up their article. Like here's their publication. I'm not I'm not expert enough in their field to be accurately to, to be confident enough in my ability to accurately portray their science in a way that that the the writer would agree. It's very tough to do that on your first go when you read a paper to instantly be in the mind of the reader and not put words in their mouth. So I don't want to create a space like that. I'm not going to be a news station. It's just going to be a fun conversation about a general topic. And today's topic is implicit bias. I'm going to take a quick second uh, to drink some water. Sorry. I will be taking water breaks every now and then, and also just, and during those water breaks, I also want to give like 30 seconds when people, if people actually start attending these things, um, to chat. So that empty box over there, I think I'm pointing the right way. There we go. That empty box over there beyond the Happy Halloween, um, that's for chatting. So that's for the audience to interact and to we can guide these conversations anywhere. If, if the presenter today gave it on implicit bias, but we get steered in a way of saying like, I don't know, what, what, if, we, what if we talk about where thought even initiates in the brain, things like that. Like we can be deviated a lot and that's fine. That's what Science Fridays is intended for. Taco Tuesdays is the other segment that I've started. Um, and today, Science Friday, I know um, how, uh, some of the, a lot of the portion, I'm very sorry, is going to be introducing it today. I want people to get familiar with this. Um, so that way we can all just get on board and, and make Science Fridays like a fun thing just really fast. Um, so I just want to just broadcast what this is. I don't, want pe I don't want people to have expectations of hearing Science Fridays, especially because I should also know I'm going on like two separate tangents at the same time. I'm very sorry. Um, but I just want to note that this is inspired by National Public Radio's Science Fridays. I'm not trying to like plagiarize them and think and this is not my original idea. If you're not familiar with NPR's National or Science Fridays is where they legit grab the scientists 
um, and interview them, but they actually get the actual scientists to talk about it. That's why those, that's really cool to listen because you can actually hear the scientists speak about their data in an because it's their data it's not like they're going to put their own words in their mouth versus with me it could be a case of telephone i'm also listening but i was also taking notes so i could misheard something i could have misconstrued something um i do ask like questions during those things to clarify but i still nonetheless am, am faulty at like it's not like i can get 100 percent of the message 100 percent of the time as an active listener so this is why mprs is nice so this is like a baby version uh we can call it science fridays junior if you will i might start calling it that actually now I think about it, um, because it's it's going to be a more low key discussion, reaching out to people um, and talking to a graduate student. So so basically like a baby researcher, if you will, like we're, we're researchers in training. Um, we do publish and stuff like that. So it's not like we're on training wheels, right? Like we, we do know how to do science as well. Uh, we've are like for me, for example, um, I've already gotten two bachelor's degree, my master's. So like I do have some basis for what I'm talking about. I'm not just pulling opinion out of nowhere, out of thin air. Um, but I am nonetheless not as expert as the people being interviewed on NPR uh, every Friday. So this is inspired by NPR Science Fridays, but in a sense, like to make it fun, have music going, and just see what people think about the current science happening around around us. In And um, of, of course, a lot of the science being discussed is going to be with found within very specific wheat fields because that's what I'm listening to. It's not like I'm attending uh, history lectures or engineering lectures or anything like that. But my hopes are to eventually have people in the chat that can maybe have those backgrounds and chat with me and we can kind of discuss about science in general across different fields. Like I love discussing other sciences. Uh, as an undergrad, I took physics, ochem, um, biochemistry, neurobiology. I took a lot of courses that were outside the scope of social psychology and I enjoyed all of those. So I I do have a decent grasp of a lot of different sciences. Now, if we start to go into history, English and literature and things like that, I just am a fan. So I just, I'm just gonna sit there and just listen. I'm just like, all right, like what about this? And just have all these questions. So um, for all those listeners out there that are have fortes in different fields than me, then I totally encourage you to dominate the chat on Fridays to say like, oh yeah, dude, like I'm working on this or anything. And maybe eventually um, I can have like a, a, just a Discord interview type thing with, with people from different backgrounds. I can even, uh, my hopes are to even bring in my own like uh, colleagues from my lab. So like sometimes I can grab like a postdoc, a graduate student, um, an RA, a research assistant, so an undergraduate student to come on with me here and we could talk and other people can get uh, can listen to other people's opinions about schooling or science or what they're doing. Um, and if the support and the following is, is good enough, I'm, I'd be super happy to go ask my own advisor. So get an academic or a researcher to begin, you know, talking to us as a community and stuff like that. So that's that would be the cool thing about Science Friday. And the other little note I want to make um, while I'm introducing Science Friday and myself to, to essentially the world here. Um, is that as time progresses, I do expect these to get better. They're probably going to get more organized as I practice. Everything I do on my channels, for the most part, is improvised. I don't have a script. I don't have anything in front of me. Literally, I just have what you see on my one screen. I just have this Welcome to Science Friday. On the other screen, I can see the chat and um, and kind of the... Uh, the stream going on here so i don't have any script or anything like that so um and that's the way it's intended to be but i do expect um i do think that as time progresses that maybe um through feedback through you guys through feedback through other people uh through my own learning experiences and through like looking at other um streamers and stuff like that i might gather some type of tips and like cool things that i could do to improve the quality of the channel but yeah, so that's kind of uh, introducing my channel. Um, the channel's still going to be mainly dedicated to s talking about science, but in a re in, during gaming. Um, I don't know. I I just recently joined, uh, or not recently joined. I've been a mentor for um, undergraduates that are coming from atypical backgrounds that are seeking to go to graduate school or, t or take the steps towards like a medical degree, a PhD, or or therapy uh, or masters and stuff like that. So we they pair graduate students pair up with undergraduates to kind of be their mentors and we can, we're there to like answer their questions, kind of guide them, kind of give um, 
what we did to like the steps we took to get into graduate school and things like that. And so, and we are like, we can provide them opportunities. So like a lot of my mentees have eventually just become my research assistants and they're still with me and um, they're amazing kids. So uh, we recently, I recently got this year's batch of mentees and we, I instantly connected with one of my mentees over gaming. Like he actually saw me, we have to zoom and he saw me with this headset and he's like, dude, is that the uh, hyper? the uh, HyperX clouds. I was like, yeah, they are. He's like, are you a gamer? I'm like, yes, I am. <laughs> and uh, we just started talking about gaming. I was like, yeah, dude. And, he's, and he was just fascinated. He's like, I've never um, heard or, or like have met a graduate student who loves games. I'm like, yeah, there's a lot of misconceptions behind grad school and how busy people and like how busy we are, like what our hobbies are and stuff. No, we're people too. We're not always working 24 seven. Um, and so I was just having a chat with him and, and kind of that was facilitated through gaming. So that's why like this channel is going to continue to, to kind of be that. But I also feel like um, sometimes we should really, I want to take the time to really highlight the science and really hi highlight the education and, and kind of the, the, the overarching goal or the overarching goal, if you will, of the channel is to ultimately promote science education and, and to just get people talking about it and get people discussing things around them instead of just um, turning off their brains as a lot of uh, things out there may want you to do um, and just kind of follow suit. But instead, let's talk about things. That's why I call it Let's Talk About It Tuesdays. Um, I just, that's what I'm trying to open up here. I'm trying to open up a channel where we can talk about it. And uh, I'm just going to sit here from my perspective as a graduate student. Again, I'm a fourth year graduate student. So now I've been in grad school for a little bit. I did five years of undergraduate school. So I've been there and got two degrees there. And I've done, and I already have my master's. So I already passed that during my graduate school training. I already passed my master's. So I do have um, a perspective that I believe can be not so... Um, easily found on the street or just like so easy to come by because you can encounter a lot of grads on the street but how are you going to know other grads so i just felt like um, we can open up a, a channel for discussion and so tuesdays and fridays are going to be very dedicated to highlighting the overarching goal of this channel which is to promote um kind of a positive vibe around things that are um, good for us in society and stuff like that because Tuesdays and I say good for society and not just science and education because there are other things that I like to talk about like the benefits of traveling the the cool things about learning about other cultures like what it can actually do for you and in a sense that is education that's why I include it in the in the cluster but I don't just want to label my two days as uh, just science and education although ultimately what I'm promoting ultimately what I'm promoting here is learning because I do uh, talk a lot about my experiences so people are going to hear a lot about me slanting toward like talking a lot about uh, college and things like that but that doesn't necessarily mean that I, I look down on other forms of learning um, going to trade school is amazing college is not for everybody and that's totally fine trade school is awesome what I admire most is learning and the pursuit of learning and just improving to push your brain a little bit and just get new skills or improve your current skills just keep pushing it and keep asking questions that's that's just such an amazing thing to be doing and that's why i'm personally passionate about science because science is kind of one of those forefronts or or the pioneers if you will of asking questions they're the ones pushing the envelope asking okay well why is this happening okay well how is this happening well what is happening you know we're at, we're, we're the ones asking and trying to answer this question what up clicks welcome or is it or is it what <laughs> so anyway so tuesdays and, and fridays are going to be like that tuesdays is going to be more really broad really opened up beyond science and education and fridays is going to be more narrowed in on science and education especially because the topics will be stemming from the science i had just heard the front i don't know what you mean by the front How do you like that animation below me, son? Can we have BDO science? I have been doing BDO science, actually. At the very beginning, without even noticing, I could have been streaming it when we... I, I streamed collecting data in BDO, and I streamed... Um, I streamed collecting data, and we streamed collect, doing the math behind the data and calculating probability. Dude, I was streaming. I told you I'm collecting the data. I'm streaming it to record all the data. This was like a month ago. <laughs> When we got all the numbers, like how do you think we got the 17 plus or minus three for tapping pen or a blap? Awesome to see the chats working. No, I haven't streamed today. 
I today I'm not doing BDO stream. I mean, I could after this segment or whatever. I just want to at least spend a little bit of time talking about science here. That's the purpose of my channel. Um, I, I mean, I'm happy to stream like gaming too in the evening. Uh, but right now, I want to have a space to talk about science and education. And today's topic, if I mean, we can talk about whatever because if there's like audience interaction, I'm happy to talk about whatever. But if we have nothing to talk about, I'm going to talk about implicit or dog bushes. What? I don't even know what you mean. Um, I'm going to talk about implicit implicit bias. So let's ask clicks. Do you know what implicit bias is? <laughs> I'm going to put you right on the spot since you're trolling me in chat. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if he has a response. I can't see if he left <laughs> the, the channel or not. <laughs> are dog bushes my science experiments? No, those are yes, those independently, I understand those words. Put together, I still don't know what you're talking about. Like, are you asking, are dogs, are they themselves bushes? Because I can just tell you, no. Okay, no. So let's, moving on to implicit bias. <laughs> um, what's implicit bias? I wanna know, I, I kinda, but how do you know? Because I've done an empirical test. So, Let's put you in the scientist seat. This is actually gonna be awesome. We can show how science is done. Let's put you in the scientist seat. Let's actually answer that question. Are dogs bushes? We could, we could get an empirical answer if you want, but you're gonna have to do the work. You're the scientist. You're the one asking the question. You ready? So how do you define dog? You gotta, you gotta define it for me. What's a dog? Yeah, but you have to define what a dog is. What's a dog? This is called defining your factors. So you gotta give me a definition of dog, otherwise we can't proceed with the scientific question. We gotta be on the same page here. Four-legged grunter. I don't know what a grunter is. You already lost me. <laughs> this, is, this you're gonna you're about to show us why sci writing science is tough. So what classifies a dog? Anything four-legged that grunts? What about cats and lions? My dog grunts, he's a pug. <laughs> Alright. Alright, let's... Let's go back to the uh, implicit bias. What's what's implicit bias? I'm really curious what people think it... Like, what people think or what... If they know what it is, they think it exists, what it is... He can't breathe, so he grunts. Yeah, that's the way that pugs are designed. <laughs> So what's implicit bias? <laughs> oh my god, clicks. <laughs> I've known clicks for a while, so... That's why I'm, I'm putting up with his trolley. His trollalal. No? So should I be just begin? I can start talking about implicit bias. Okay. I think I'm just going to start then. Because <laughs> we're, we're almost at 30 minutes. Okay, I'm going to start then. No guesses on implicit bias? Alright, let's begin then. So let's start with the first word, what's implicit? Well, it's the opposite of explicit. Explicit are things that are obvious, or like things that you know. Explicit knowledge is something that is kind of in your conscious mind, right? Implicit is the opposite. You could argue, you, not argue, but it's basically synonymous with, not, I don't wanna say completely synonymous, but it's basically like saying, um, like your unconscious, like processes that are happening, not necessarily that you're um, fully aware of. Um, for example, one one thing you can kind of see as an implicit process is you don't have to tell your heart to beat, but you know it's beating. So this is kind of the way um, 
you can think about implicit science in a, in a way. It's like we have a lot of evidence in our science that shows there are implicit processes. So, so you went. I'm really happy you did this. This is awesome. All right, let's read it. In social identity theory, which is something I am very uh, familiar with, that's uh, if you have the citation there, it's Taj Fell and Turner. If anyone is, I'll put it in the chat. If anyone is very interested in social identity theory, we'll put social identity theory, Taj Fell and Turner. Those are the scientists. Some of the big, big scientists behind social identity theory. All right, in social identity theory, an implicit bias or implicit stereotype is the pre what? Pre reflective attribution of particular qualities by an individual to a member of some social. Okay, we have to digest. Where did you find this definition? This is way more complicated than pre reflective attribution. So that is, we can unpack that word. So pre reflective, again, implicit. Wikipedia? Okay, I guess someone got really. Uh, caught up in the, in the jargon there. Pre-reflective is that sense of like your your um, unconscious processes. So uh, there's a lot of evidence out there in cognitive psychology that we have several processes kind of occurring in the mind, um, and that some of these are implicit to us. Attribution. Attribution, something I'm currently really focusing on my dissertation, actually. Attribution. I'm, I'm dipping my toes. Actually, I'm, I don't even want to say I'm dipping my toes. I'm going full dive into the attribution literature. I was so new to it before my dissertation. And now I'm like, every week it feels like I'm actually starting to understand attribution and attribution literature. Um, attribution is like making an inference about someone's personality. Um, I think I was mentioning this uh, the, the other day in one of the streams about the fundamental attribution error, which is basically, um, I'll write that down here for people to Google if they want. Fundamental attribution error. This is a cool, cool science. Excuse me. Implicit bias, first published. Okay, it wasn't first published in 2015. Okay, let's see. Implicit bias suggests that people can act on the basis of prejudice and stereotypes without intending to do so while psychologists in the field of implicit social cognition uh, study consumer products, self-esteem, food, alcohol, political values, and more. The most striking and well-known research has focused on implicit biases toward me. <laughs> what? <laughs> Where did you pull this one? Oh, that is hilarious. Oh. Uh... That's really funny. Hey, the song played at the beginning of the stream. Um, <laughs> that's quite funny. <laughs> okay, anyway, the fundamental attribution error. So what is it? What is the fundamental attribution error? Um, the fundamental attribution error is this notion that, let's say you're you're sitting there on a park bench, in a, in a park, obviously, but across the street or maybe on the, or wherever, in front of you, someone's walking and they trip. So... You might think, man, that person's clumsy. They should watch where they're going. Hello? Um, but let's say that person was you. Members of socially stigmatized groups such as African-American women and the LGBTQ. Yeah. Implicit bias affects them. Yes. I have studies. I actually have raw. I uh, know not raw. It's already uh, analyzed data. Um, I already have data that shows that, that uh, there's an implicit bias in something called the uh, shooter task. And the shooter task, the citation is Joshua Carell from Colorado. I can only paste 500 charts. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, thank you for pasting that. It's actually really helpful to have up the uh, definitions there. Um, so anyway, fundamental attribution error. So as you're walking, let's just say you're the one that's walking. Someone else is watching you. But um, you're concerned over you. So you're walking, you trip. Do you instantly say, wow, I'm a, a clumsy person. I should watch where I'm going. Or do you maybe look back, look at the concrete and be like, wow, that's lifted up. Someone should fix that. Right? So you're more likely to do the latter. You're more likely to kind of look around, look at the environment, see what caused you to trip. This is called the fundamental attribution error because how can we apply that logic? We give ourselves the time of day to say, to look around and give ourselves the chance to rationalize what had just happened to us. But we don't give that time of day to the person we're, we're looking at. So we only saw a split second of data of that person's behavior, yet you're making a sweepy generalization regarding that person's 
personality. You're saying they're lazy, they're clumsy. Sorry, not lazy. They're clumsy. That's a personality trait. You would have to actually have seen a lot of data to be able to conclude that. Yet we do this, and this is kind of the idea behind this fundamental attribution error. You're making these uh, attributions about someone's personality, but you're basing it on very little data, like non-existent data almost. Um, so implicit bias is this notion that because you're going to create these errors, you like because like of, of different cognitive processes, there can exist this system of of pre-existing beliefs, attitudes that you hold. Like if you grew up in, um, let's just say you grew up in a household where they kept telling you apples were horrible, apples were horrible. You'd be like, anytime you go out to the world, you'd see an apple and you start associate with bad things, and then you start to develop behaviors around that type of. Uh, you start to develop behaviors that you otherwise wouldn't have if you weren't told apples were bad. That's kind of like going out, but you don't, you're not always processing the apples are bad. You just kind of fear apples for, you don't really, you don't really think about it. You just go, oh no, apples are bad. No, because that's just the way it, you grew up and you made that connection. Um, so there's this notion that your pre-existing attitudes or beliefs can influence the way you behave and that this is done automatically that you don't actually get a chance to engage in what um there's this other group of scientists i believe it's gilbert oh my god if i get no I, i'm pretty sure pelham 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 come on if i could spell and kroll gilbert pelham and kroll so they developed this model of attribution that kind of explains uh the three steps to make attributions starting from um starting from categorization what's happening in front of me like what is it to characterization or no sorry characterizations for first so what is happening in front of me let's characterize it and then you categorize it and then you enter into a phase called correction phase so the first two phases originally were thought to, to be the first phase which was what is it um, characterization was automatic but that the why is it why is this happening or what's going on um, that contemplation that that was done deliberately um, however, Gilbert Pelham and Kroll, and uh, obviously in other papers, started to see that actually there's they could provide evidence that showed no, that's not uh, PEMDAS. They um, they started to show evidence that that's not necessarily the case. That they actually believe they show this they presented this model that they believe that the second phase category or characterization was also an automatic thing. And that that is prone to bias and, inf and influence from implicit bias, so your pre-existing notions. Um, so this is huge because, um, and the correction phase, I'll just quickly finish the correction phase. The correction phase is where you do enter a deliberate process where you say, okay, let me reanalyze the data, reanalyze my beliefs and, and adjust uh, accordingly. And then kind of readjust my notion or my or what I think is happening. Um, oh, I just noticed the animation wasn't going. Um, so that's kind of the correction phase. and so. There's a lot of instances, there's there's several, uh, there's a lot of evidence out there, a lot of science that kind of shows that a lot of us don't engage in that correction phase when it comes to uh, making attributions. And here's a, here's a quick example. If um, all over social media, we're seeing a lot of videos out there and, and uh, my intention of these chats are never to dis I don't like to dis I don't want to discuss polarizing topics. So a lot of this, a lot of my research does deal with very polarizing topics, but it is important. These are important topics to research, and just know that I'm always speaking when I speak about these sciences. Um, I'm speaking as 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 objective as possible. We're scientists, and we try to leave our emotions at the door, and we just try to seek the data and what and we try to seek the truth, regardless of what it's going to tell us, regardless of what we believe. Um, we have to leave our emotions at the door and just go with what the data tell us. Um, and so, um, in doing so, we ha we study uh, topics that are that can be quite sensitive to certain people. Like my my some of my research topics do involve um, intergroup conflicts. So, um, like conflict between white communities and black communities for example and understanding the conflict why is it there and what does it do to the individuals uh the, the respective groups why is it continuing what are the what are the long-lasting impacts and it doesn't have to be just those two social groups but many different types of social groups um so those topics are very uh they can be very touchy for some people and that's not the intention of this channel the intention of this channel is to um, discuss this in a, in, a, in a scientific manner where we're not going to be harassing each other over beliefs but more so just discussing ideas and the science behind it. Um, so 
going back to what I was going with implicit bias, um, was that people can make sweeping attributions regarding an instance. So if you look at, maybe you saw a police officer arresting a, a citizen and the police officer happened to be white and the citizen happened to be black, then you would be, uh, you would see comments spewing from all different sides, accusing one side of doing this, of being that, of being racist or too aggressive, and the other side saying, no, it was the citizen that was being too aggressive. No, the officers were not. And you get all these fighting over a four second clip or five second clip. How do people come to such bold conclusions regarding the officers' uh, attitudes, beliefs, and all that, and the citizens' attitudes, beliefs, and all that? How do people come to such bold conclusions, right? So sometimes our implicit biases may lead us to make such bold conclusions. And that's kind of the topic of today's uh, lecture that I heard from a professor. Um, but he was studying it in, in, he also, we also went over a little bit about how implicit bias can feed into machine learning. There's a lot of science experiment. Wait, what? I want to believe what I believe, like strawberry ice cream is trash? That's an opinion and that's fine. You can hold your opinion. You don't need science for an opinion. So as simple as that. If you want to just say strawberry ice cream is trash, I'll be like, yeah, I mean, I like it, but you do you, man. Does that make sense? So any thoughts out there about implicit bias? How do we prove it? That it's trash? Well, my first question is why do you want to prove it? Like why use time and resources to do it? Why why consume the time right now of this chat? <laughs> what do you think about implicit bias? Does it, do you think it exists? Some people don't think it doesn't exist. Other people may believe it feeds that it has absolute control over us. It's like a spectrum of beliefs regarding implicit bias. It's crazy. Was anything unclear? And again, um, during these talks, it's I'm not intended. I'm not. It's not intended to be teaching people. I'm not teaching these topics. I'm just wanting to spark up a conversation and talk about the science happening around us. And if people have questions, then we can delve into the science. And I'm gonna be providing the citations a lot because, or the names of, of the researchers and stuff, just so people can just be Googling it. And there you go, there you have the empirical article and there's your opportunity to learn. This is an opportunity to talk about it and also just ask a graduate student questions. Um, you don't like implicit bias? Oh, you don't like strawberry ice cream. So you have an implicit, do you have, maybe you have an implicit bias regarding uh, strawberry ice cream. Do you know why you don't like strawberry ice cream? So that could be that could be a plethora of, of reasons why, but um, but what makes you do you think that's implicit bias? You think it's genetic? Is genetic implicit bias? Would buy it. Maybe he was biased. But so you could be externally biased or internally biased, or explicitly biased, or implicitly biased. You're very explicitly biased right now. You had a filter effect. Man. Well, anyway, beyond ice cream. <laughs> We're at 43 minutes. Um, since I think it's just clicks right now, we can, we can, uh, I'm just trying to give chat a second. I was using an example of ice cream. Okay. All right. We can, we can run with it, but, uh, how's that an implicit bias? I guess, I mean, it was made more explicit though, because you were, you were just never had access to it. I mean, I guess it could become implicit too. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that was, do you think that is implicit bias? Why you don't like strawberry ice cream? Now, have you, did you give it a fair chance? Then go eat strawberry ice cream and still decide that you don't like it because then it's explicit. Okay, so he was biased and didn't let you get it. 
But what about you? Do you think that's an implicit bias or explicit bias? Well, that's the point of today. What do you? But what do you think? We need answers here. We're not just gonna sit here saying I don't know to each other. <laughs> Am I putting you too much on the spot on the first Science Friday ever? Oh, I see. But you can just talk about it in the terms you want to talk about. It. But you don't, and you don't really have to anyway. I don't really want to put you on the spot. Uh, what else can we talk about? Any? Do you, do you want me to clarify any anything? Anything I can define or clarify from the, the theoretical or the scientific perspective? I guess. Evolution with him. Wait, in regards to implicit bias, or just you want to talk about evolution in general? I'm happy to talk about evolution in general or evolutionary psychology. That's also a lot of fun to talk about. Yeah, but yeah, just evolution. Or the evolution of implicit bias, like why we might have it. Like what evolutionary mechanisms would evolve to make us have implicit bias? So I can speculate. I don't have, I don't know all the science behind it, but I can speculate based on like my knowledge of the of the brain and stuff. So uh, of of like the adaptation, the adaptive function of implicit bias. That's actually a pretty, yeah, yeah. That's actually a pretty cool. Uh, wait, I don't know. And now I don't know what you're wanting to. Okay, let me. I'm gonna give you like a lot of time to respond this time. Is it? A, you want to talk about the evolutionary reason why we have implicit bias built into us, or B, just evolution? Still, are you still here? First one, but but definitions. Okay, okay, all right. What uh, what should what should I what what should I try to define? Wait now, you want both? You want to talk about evolution in general? Okay, let's let's start with implicit bias and evolution. Then, like the the possible adaptive function behind implicit bias. I think I actually don't think it's that well. Since I don't know a lot of the literature there, and I can't be like, oh, referencing specific, oh, explicit versus implicit. Okay, explicit bias is, yeah, that's actually, okay, I see. Um, so an implicit bias may be, I guess the simplest way of defining this would be explicit is that you're aware that you're biased. So you are aware that you don't like strawberry. That's an explicit bias because now you're, so bias is a behavior that you that is a skewed behavior. So otherwise, Everything, um, all things considered, or all things equal, I should say, like pricing, quantity of the ice cream, whatever. Normally, you sh you should just pick at random, and all of them would be equal to you. That would be an unbiased choice. Biased choice would be you continuing to get chocolate over and over and over and over again. That's an explicit bias, and you're saying I prefer chocolate over the other ones. That's an explicit bias. Does that make sense? And I'm not saying that's a negative thing. In this. My, generally, when we talk here, it's never meant to be negatively charged or positively charged. We're just talking about science and definitions. So just because you're biased doesn't mean you're wrong or anything like that. So now implicit would be you go to the uh, you go to the grocery store. On your way, you smell uh, like let's just say you're hungry, you're shopping, you buy your ice cream, whatever, but you smell Subway. And then you are shopping and then when you exit, you go home and you're like, what should I get to eat? And then you like when you, or like you you say, what should I get to eat? And then you open up uh, your groceries, and you have lettuce, and you think like, oh, this is fresh lettuce, right? 
and then you had smelled the subway. So your brain can automatically connect eat fresh, like the, the subway, like a subliminal language, if you want, to the smell to empower the memory. And then you could be like, I think I'm going to order subway. You're not consciously aware where that came from, but this is how commercials kind of function with um, trying to get you to make an implicit association when you're going to go make a choice to buy something. This is how they thrive. This is why um, a lot of social neuroscientists and social psychologists are hired at big companies because they're trying to make people establish these relationships and establish these biases towards their product and not other products. What's not real? Implicit bias? So why do you say it's not real? Should I bring you into Discord? We can dis we can discuss it on Discord if it's easier. I'm happy to. But only if you want to. Because this is this is a live stream. <laughs> Yeah, no, I meant like right now, if you want to, so to speak, call in to Science Friday and talk, I could, uh, I, could I can like uh, do the talk now or call you now on, on Discord. Or you can just keep chatting on the, in the chat. Or if you're done, if you're too tired. Oh, okay. No worries. No worries. But what makes you say, uh, why do you think implicit isn't real? Do you think it's like a hocus pocus? Okay, so what if I told you that there are e experiments that can show you implicit bias, objectively speaking? You can measure it. There's uh, a lot of studies that show implicit bias. And they also show, like, there's also something called, <laughs> you'll read it and say it's wrong, even though they have data and math that back them up. <laughs> so what are you backing your site up with? I'm curious. What makes you say that science is wrong? If Because I'll provide you the, uh, the papers if you want, if you want to read them. But why would you say it's still wrong? Based on what evidence do you have that implicit bias does not exist? Because even in my own lab, I've run an experiment that deals with implicit bias, and we we replicated like the 20 papers I've already replicated implicit bias, and we got this we got very similar trends in our data. No, that was just an example. <laughs> Obviously, it's a weak example, but it's an example, right? You don't take that one to heart, like. Like in, what's another way I can, I can try to explain this without using very polarizing literature. And it's, and it's not that you smelled the lettuce, it's that you passed the subway, smelled the subway, assuming you like subway, right? This has, this is the only way it would work. Assuming you like the subway, you went home, you saw lettuce, you thought, oh, this is fresh lettuce. Their slogan at, uh, subway is eat fresh so you, you kind of ping together memories that causes these nodal memories so memories kind of it's thought to work like kind of nodes like you activate a node and it's called spreading activation in the brain and so as one memory is activated then another it can span out in many different ways your memories and so that's what i was saying like you may have this network of memories and you're not aware of it you're not aware of all your processes happening in your mind and this is kind of where implicit bias lives you're not actively thinking back. When you smell a certain fragrance, you're like, oh, I remember the mountains or something. You're not actively processing the data. All right, processing um, smell molecule one. Smell molecule one matches smell molecule alpha B of that place that I'm remembering. Uh, you're not doing any of that. It's just super fast 
and you're because you're processing a lot of this unactively because it doesn't make sense to have to process all that data actively that would cost you way too much energy too much of your focus you need to focus on staying alive brother you got to be out there staying alive <laughs> right remember if you want to talk about we can integrate a little bit of evolutionary psychology here you can you can totally you have a lot of we have a lot of evidence that shows the brain is active without the person being aware and we have neurons are firing before action or motor action happens or motor e motor neurons even engage we have other parts of the brain that you can probe in rats and show even rats have this part of the brain you can probe that and show that there are parts of the, there are neurons that are already firing to make a decision before the rat even begins to move anything and before you begin to move it's called a plant you can what are you talking about we have evidence that shows this there's a lot of data that shows this You can use cognitive psychology to gather data that, that shows uh, evidence of implicit bias. You just have to, it's very easy to make implicit bias come out. All you have to do is put a time constraint or a pressure on someone, really put stress on them, stress out your subjects. And implicit, your mind has to start reacting instead of thinking. It starts to be put under like this split second reaction mode. And that's where you can start to see implicit bias begin to emerge. So I'll provide all the citations if you want. I just have to go to my uh, folders and grab them. I don't have them at, like right here on my desktop to just be dumping into chat. <laughs> but that's like putting a neurode into the uh, rat's brain. That is strict evidence right there. We're showing neuron activity. But okay, you're forming an opinion and you haven't even read this experiment. So you have some sort of bias against science that I can already detect. Right now it's pretty explicit. So what makes you question the science without ever having seen these experiments? You say that sounds like a screwed up experiment when I haven't even described the experiment to you. I just said one methodology that's capable of capturing data that can record in, like this uh, notion that neurons are firing before you're even aware of it. But I didn't even tell you the experimental design. I didn't tell you how they set it up or how they analyze the data, nothing like that. So how could you classify the experiment as screwed up if you don't know anything about it or who ran it? So there's a bias there. You're already shooting down notions without having have thought it. Here's a data point right here. <laughs> You're stuck on the lettuce example. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get stuck on the lettuce, man. Don't get stuck on the lettuce. <laughs> Don't get stuck on the lettuce. That was just an example of how it can function. Doesn't mean it will function. There's a difference between saying theoretically this is how it would function. I don't know you personally with all your desires. If I knew your favorite food, then I could probably manipulate your environment to make you buy that food more. This is how like people are getting people onto social media and, and getting addicted. There's like that whole social dilemma thing on Netflix. Like neuroscience is figuring out the patterns in human behavior, and we're able to we're starting to get pretty good at accurately predicting human behavior under certain contexts that you can start to make it so that way people are more addicted to social media and they stay on longer just so they can generate more uh, ad revenue. So that's neuroscience is doing. There's evidence of these things. There's evidence of implicit bias through neuroscience and through cognitive psychology. Shrimp. Yeah, I don't know of any restaurants or any commercials for shrimp, so it's not like I could give you an implicit bias association there. But like, okay, so there's something, you can Google this one if you want. If you want to look at a implicit association. This is a cognitive psychology methodology. Association task. This is an example of how you can get an implicit a measurement of implicit association. Um, and what, all you have to do is apply a time constraint and then people start to make associations uh, spontaneously but in a predictable manner. So it's not just due to chance because that's what the statistics tell us and our mathematical models.
So if we could predict people's people's mental associations to things before they even make them, I think our science is onto something. But we're making very, very accurate predictions regarding a behavior such as implicit association. So that's why uh, I'll provide the papers in. And it'd be very strange to me if you said you still don't believe in implicit association because the, the data is, is there. The data are there. No. Why? Why? What? Why would they like bright food over dark food? That's, where's the association? Okay, but light food, like, that doesn't describe much. I don't even know what light food means. Does that mean, like, a salad is light relative to a steak because that's heavy to the stomach? Or, like, dark meaning, like, the physical color of the steak? So if I grill the steak, like, raw versus charred, that might one might perceive... Yeah, but I'm just giving you an example. Like, there's a color to the steak. Like, I, I just don't know how you quantify color like that. Like, what color is a salad? Would you classify it? And like, what does light mean versus dark? What color is a pizza? Because you could put dark stuff on a pizza, right? Black olives, anchovies. But the cheese is white or light. It's a very light color. So it contrasts a lot. So this is why like, I don't get this question because like, it's very vague. Well, with that one, it's not necessarily any sort of implicit association or anything. All you have to do, if you wanted, if you're a car maker, and you wanted to sell a car, a certain car, like what your what your interest is making the most money, you don't have to worry about making an implicit association. You could literally just go out there, ask like a survey, two million people, what's your favorite color in a car, and then whatever the average, the like the highest number is, make it in that. The next highest, then make your next color in that color. Like it's you don't need to do anything fancy to be able to to make like people now you now why people like it why people like some colors could be implicit but it could also be explicit so it's just all a matter of like who's the target that you're trying to ask what their bias is and what bias you want to like target there because like i said a company a, well if i if i know why blue is my favorite color then it's explicit it's explicitly known to me that's why it's that's what it means to be explicit it's known to me so once it's known it's known to you it's no longer implicit implicit an implicit association is something you're not aware of that drives certain processes or behaviors. That makes sense? Because you can make behaviors, you can predict people's behaviors without them knowing they're going to do it. And if we can accurately predict that, that's evidence that um, there's unconscious processes happening. And if you can predict, and if you can accurately predict, if you can accurately predict that their behavior will be biased in this, in one direction, you can say, I believe, I predict, not even believe, I predict that they're going to answer in this manner all the time. So that means a biased manner. Bias just means you're skewed. It doesn't mean that you hold negative views about something. Let's not confuse the definition of bias. It just means it deviates from like a norm or, or not a norm. It just means that you tend on something, you trend on something. So if we can accurately predict that before the participant even begins to tell us anything, what does that tell you? If we can accurately predict their behavior without the the participant even being able to have control over that behavior or even them being aware of it.
but we can accurately predict their decisions. What does that tell you? So I can give you an example of a of a of a um, experiment that that shows the emergence of an implicit bias. Okay, so um, let's try to put it in a gaming sense because I don't want to, the original one, which is Joshua Carell. So if people want to read about um, implicit bias and police shootings, um, that's who you can go read about. So I'm not gonna I'm not here to talk about his experiments and stuff like that because again the the I'm I'm here to be more like the person that can introduce you to these topics. Um, so I'll put in chat Joshua Joshua Carell. You just Google Google Joshua Carell implicit bias. The University of Colorado is where he did those projects. So basically, let's just imagine. You're um, playing counter. You're familiar with Counter Strike, right? Okay, cool. So let's just say your whole life you've been CT. You've been counter. You've been counter terrorist your whole life, because the game does randomize you. But let's just say your entire life you've been a counter counter terrorist. And out there in the real world, there's going to be civilians, there's going to be terrorists, and there's going to be other counter terrorists. Okay, so counter terrorist is your in group, like that's your team. You don't fire at counter terrorists, that's, and you fire at terrorists, right? Um, actually, this is gonna be a horrible, horrible way because it removes the fact. I guess I, I'll just talk about the original study. You know what? Like, I'm not gonna censor the science, but remember that this is not intended to be uh, racially charged chat in any way. But this is just kind of the way. Um, this is the way they did because the I don't want to confuse you with Counter Strike. And, and all that stuff. So let's just go over this study. So um, in this study, you're, you're a participant. You come into the lab, and you, you sit down at a computer, and you're told you're going to play a like a, almost like a video game. Let me turn on the lights in my apartment really fast because it's starting to get really dark. Okay, so. You're gonna you sit down at a computer and you're gonna play. Um, they tell you you're gonna play like a game, a simulation, and it's like a first-person shooter game. And your objective in this game is to shoot targets holding guns, and to not shoot targets not holding guns. Does that make sense so far? So, uh, unfortunately, in the game, you do have a button to not shoot. That's unlike you know like video games where if you don't want to shoot, just don't click the button. Um, but the problem is in in these experiments, we have to know whether they wanted to not shoot or they just made a mistake and forgot to shoot or something there there's no way to tell so you have to you have to uh, impose that rule so you say um, okay so press this button to shoot so let's just say Z on the keyboard and you're gonna press M to not shoot or vice versa like dominant hand goes on trigger so if they're right-handed then M would be the trigger and Z would be not shoot um, but then no actually we actually no we randomize it we randomize it sorry we did not do dominant we didn't care for dominant hand uh, we did take that into account in our in our factorial analysis, and it doesn't play it didn't have a significant impact on the data, so it didn't matter of handedness. But anyway, that's that's a different point. Um, so you're told, all right, you're going to press M to fire, Z to not fire. Uh, your objective is fire anyone holding a weapon. Do not fire at anyone that is not holding a weapon. That's your job. If someone's holding a weapon and you do not fire at them, you will get shot, and you have about like a couple of seconds to make the decision before you get shot. Um, if you make accurate decisions, you get points. If you make inaccurate decisions, you get minus points. So if you shoot a civilian, like an unarmed civilian, you get like minus 20 or 30 points. If you shoot like a, um, the person holding a weapon at, like, and you shoot them, you get like 20 or 30 points. If you get shot, you get minus 100 because you died and the ultimate goal is to keep yourself alive. Um, so when you take people through this game and you give them unlimited time per trial which means so basically you sit down at the desk and then there's going to be a screen before you like a back like just an image of a park or something and then someone's going to flash up and they're going to be in a pose and they could be in a pose holding a bottle like this or they might be in a similar pose but holding a gun kind of like in the air or something uh they might be holding a phone or they might be aiming a gun at you so they're just going to flash up and do it and then you kind of have to react to it really fast so it's kind of a reaction-based uh, game, just like Counter-Strike would be if, it, if, uh, if you're a CT and a T appears around the corner, you got to really quick shoot them. If they had friendly fire on and a CT appears around the corner, then you got to be really quick and not shoot them, right? You don't want to accidentally shoot your teammate. Um, 
So in this game, that's what they're told. And if you give people infinite time, they're 100% accurate, right? And so that doesn't tell you anything if you can take all the time in the world to be accurate. So what happens when you start to apply time pressure, like more and more time pressure, right? So if, so you tell them, you have a couple of seconds, otherwise you get shot. That's the time pressure and that's how you apply it. Um, so when that starts to happen, you start to see error emerge, right? As people make mistakes, do and the question becomes, do people make mistakes in a randomized fashion or in a predictable fashion? And this is how we can, this is the measurement of implicit bias. And this is the data here, is when they do make mistakes, is it predictable? Can we predict which mistakes they're going to make before they even make them? Or are they going to make mistakes in a more random manner where we can't predict anything? Yeah, let, me, let me start another playlist really quick. Does that make sense so far? Because that needs to make sense, what the question was there, like the scientific question needing to be answered. Does it make sense? We're, we're doing a test of whether the error, when error happens in this game, is it random or is it predictable? That's the, that's the scientific question here. Because what, okay, cool. I thought you said why. I was like, that's, so that's our question. So basically why would we set up that question? Because if it's predictable, like how, if we can predict it like 100% of the time, then we're onto something really strong. That's like saying we're onto the, the theory of gravity here. If I can predict behavior 100% of the time, that's like saying I can predict the behavior of this 100% of the time. Every time I let go, it's going to fall. So that's that's like kind of what we as as uh, social psychologists strive to meet. We're trying to we're trying to refine our science over and over again through a lot of iterations of our studies to be able to get predictability really high, akin to saying I can predict the behavior of this 100% of the time. Um, so if we can accurately predict above chance. The behavior of people, what would that tell you, Clicks? What does that tell you? If I can say they're going to create errors on this specific target way more than these other types of targets, like when they make an error, it's going to be on this target over the other ones, and I can put a bet on it and be safe on it, and I feel safe on it. What do you, like, what do you make of that? Because that's how science functions. We always have to make predictions we act before we actually run the experiment. Because otherwise we can run the experiment and then say, oh yeah, that matched my prediction. And then the science is all messed up. We have to show that we thought about this before we ran the experiment and then have models to reflect that experiment. So look, this is what it predicts. And if you could show your data in the real world, like collect the data in the real world, show that your model that you built beforehand reflects that, then people have more confidence that you built your model correctly and that what you're doing is something. So going back to the question over here is, what would it tell you that when people do create errors when in this uh, shooting game, um, that I can predict when they're going to create those errors above chance. So chance would be like, if there's four types of targets, like above chance would be 25% chance, right? So if I could predict it with like 60% accuracy or 80% accuracy, that'd be pretty good for a 25% random chance. If there's only two targets involved, then I have a fit, the participant has like a 50% chance. So unarmed versus armed, right? That's a 50% chance of getting it right. So above chance would have to be, and your statistics would tell you what's significantly above chance. So depending on your model, what picture, what? I don't know, I'm so confused. I am so confused, but okay. Um, so, uh, <laughs> I lost my train of thought with your old strawberry ice cream. <laughs> um, we're talking about implicit bias. Uh, oh, well, yeah, of course. Um, so yeah, so if I can, if I, yeah, the statistics tell us how significant uh, how much percent above chance I have to be for it to for us to care? That's what a lot of statistics tell us. Like, all right, yes, there is a difference between X and Y, but does the difference actually matter to us? That's what kind of st stats can inform us on. Um, the pick of the. Oh, you looked at uh, you're looking at Joshua Carell's implicit bias and the shooter task. Well, that's real life. 
this is this is what cops say when they when they're getting indicted as to like those cops that get on the news because they're accused of being like racist or stuff they say well it's hard to see uh he had something that looked like a gun so i shot so this is why these images need to not be the same case as, as real life it's it's meant to be slightly ambiguous because this is what cops encounter in the real life it's not like we can give them clear, super clear uh, answers because then they'll just get 100% on the test. That doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense at all. It has to be what you would encounter on the street. And on the street, there's oftentimes ambiguity, which gives room for error. And so if I can predict when you will shoot versus not very accurately, I think you're on to something. And this is what we're calling the implicit bias because you don't have time to think about your actions. You just have to act. There's no explicit, there's no conscious thought put into your, your trigger. You're just like, boom, boom, boom. You have to fire super fast and these things are going fast. It's not like you get all the time in the world because again, if you got all the time in the world, you won't, you won't mess up, but you don't have all the time in the world. So you have to start behaving on a knee on a knee jerk reaction. And if I can predict in how your knee jerk reaction is going to look with the data accurately, then I think I'm onto something. And that's the implicit bias. And this is this is the evidence of the implicit bias emerging. Because you're behaving in a very biased manner, like the way you behave is not random when we put the time constraint on. So uh, the Joshua Carell paper shows the evidence that when the when the errors are made, so when people shoot, an unarmed citizen tends to be a black target, not a white target, and that's significant. So there's there's an implicit bias in the way people are perceiving others to be dangerous or not. And it's not like the subjects are actively thinking, oh, that person's skin color is this, I need to do this. Nope, it's they have a split second. Just like that, you gotta make a split decision. But we can accurately predict that they're gonna make more errors towards the target that is black real, uh, compared to the tor towards the target that's white. This experiment that I mentioned that's been replicated so many times now because a lot of people don't believe it and they need to run it themselves, they run it and it merges and you're like, holy cow, this is not cool. Um, and the thing about these studies is you can do it on a lot of participants and it emerges across a lot of different social groups. So even people who identify as black um, also produce this biased thing. So it kind of speaks to our general culture as a whole, not just individual social groups. So like maybe uh, movies are portraying um, people of black backgrounds all the time as thugs and that's kind of feeding into people's association of black citizens with gangster and, and violence and stuff like that. What do you mean the Pixar? I don't, but I don't understand what you mean by they're screwed. Oops. Okay, now which which uh which article did you find? I'm gonna have to find it. Um, but the we don't have to do it. like I can talk to you more about the pictures and stuff. I'm happy to. But do you get the general point here of how you can you can get data for implicit um, bias? And it's not it's not only in this realm that you can find it. You can find it in a lot of things. Like I can be giving you IATs um, on implicit association tasks on a lot of things and see how you associate certain things with other things and put a time constraint to make it an implicit association task or put a pressure on you. So does that make sense? Or are you still a non-believer of, of implicit science, of implicit bias? Well, it, on purpose. 
it does make the science change because otherwise you're studying explicit bias if you don't put the time constraint on. If I allow people to take all the time in the world and they will think about their actions, that makes it explicit so that you'd make you miss the point completely. So I have to put the time pressure because I have to change the science to make it about implicit bias, not explicit. So that time pressure is required. Otherwise, you're not studying the right factor. No, they are looking at the picture because they're, they're, you can incentivize people to win a lot of money, for example. So there's a motivation there, right? And we know our participants are going to be motivated to not appear racist, but when you put a time pressure on them that fast, they can't think about it. They can't think about it. They just have to shoot or not shoot. But the thing is, when you, you say it as if that were random, it comes to a point where people are just clicking buttons. If that were the case, we should not be able to predict it to the degree that we predict it, but yet we can. We predict it and it happens. It happens just as we can. our models describe it. So it's not just people looking at pic, uh, a picture, just pointing and clicking, because that would describe a random event. It doesn't. They are processing on some level uh, social identities. They're processing them because their behavior is emerging as a biased emergence. Otherwise, if they weren't processing that, then it should look more random. But it doesn't. So this is why that statement is, is you can provide that the, the, the data don't well does not reflect what you say clicks and it comes to a point that people are just clicking buttons Okay, sounds good. All right, I guess that'll be a. Uh, it was nice talking with Clicks. Thanks for joining in. I really appreciate helping uh, uh, sitting in the chair. I know I put you on the spot this whole time, so I really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, we can talk on Discord. Um, I think I'm going to conclude Science Friday there. That was, that was uh, thanks to Clicks. That was longer than. Then I thought I would be able to go because I was like running out of like, of, like of how I can continue talking to myself basically. Um, so yeah, let's end it there so that way also this this recording isn't stupid long for, um, for people if they are going to listen to any recorded version of this, whether it be the VOD or the the YouTube video. Let's see if YouTube even allows me to upload this. <laughs> it's an hour and 22 minutes now. So, um, so thanks again for anyone listening. Uh, clicks again. Thank you so much for talking and just kind of having fun here, but also talking about the science. I really appreciate it. I really appreciate it and all the questions. Um, and for people just listening, you feel free to join in and uh, drive the conversations too. Uh, that's what this is for. It's supposed to be just an open space to discuss just ideas or beliefs, because a lot of this is going to boil down to our opinions too. It's not intended to be purely scientific. If it was, I'll just, uh, I'll, like I said, if you guys want straight objective talks and stuff like that, I can definitely provide uh, resources for um, getting in touch with like the science and getting the papers or getting talks um, and things like that. Um, this is again, just going to be us chatting about, about stuff uh, related to science and education. Um, so happy Halloween, everybody, and uh, thanks for tuning in. Have a good weekend, everybody. <laughs>